This is another Greek term, a rather ugly one, deontology, which essentially is, you can think of as, the alternative to any form of consequentialism. Uh, a deontological view, sometimes referred to as a rule-based view, although they're not really all exactly rules, as you'll see, um, essentially says some acts can be wrong even if they do lead to the best consequences, and typically deontologists think that there are some constraints on what we ought to do which make them wrong, no matter what the consequences. So, um, the most famous example, which in a way is a little bit like the sheriff example I gave you, although even more hypothetical, comes from the brothers Karamazov, where Ivan asks Alyosha this question, Imagine that you're creating a fabric of human destiny with the object of making men happy in the end, giving them peace and rest at last, but that it was essential and, and inevitable to torture to death only one tiny creature. That baby beating its breast with its fist, for instance. And then the question is, would you do that? Would you produce, I guess really what Ivan is talking about, would you produce a kind of utopia on earth, where everybody's going to be happy, peace is going to prevail, and so on, but you have to torture one small child, obviously innocent. And Alyosha says he would not do that, thereby saying there are some things that are absolutely wrong no matter what, taking a, a deontological view. As you can see, this example is, is more hypothetical than the one about the sheriff, um, in that it's hard to imagine any circumstances in which the way to achieve utopia is to torture one small child. I mean, okay, you could, you could imagine that there is some all-powerful demon who says, I will allow everyone to be happy if only you will torture this child. We can always get around bizarre factual stories by imagining powerful demons who will make promises and somehow you're supposed to know that you can trust their promises. I'm not sure why. Um, so, yes, you, you, know, you can kind of imagine it, but, but it's it, clearly more bizarre. And um, so if you think about that, yes, it's terrible to imagine yourself having to torture this small child, but remember, if you don't torture this small child, this is implicit, there's going to be millions of small children for millennia to come who will suffer in all sorts of ways. Some of them, no doubt, will be tortured by sadistic people. Others will starve to death or get all sorts of diseases and die in painful agonies. And let's assume we really are talking about, it's not absolutely clear that I have means it, we're really talking about a utopian situation in which never more will any child, or any adult for that matter, starve to death, die of a painful disease, or be tortured by anyone else. So if we think about that, do we want to answer the question in the way that Alyosha did? Actually, let's see how many of you think you would. So given that you, it's really a choice between achieving this kind of utopia, but you have to torture this one child in order to do it, would you do it? Okay, yes, show of hands. Okay, no. I think the yeses actually have it. Okay, interesting. Maybe you're not a random sample having enrolled in this course. I'm not sure. <laughs> but clearly, I think Dostoevsky was clearly on Alyosha's side in this question. Now, I want to ask, well, what really lies behind this idea? What kinds of ethics can defend the idea that there are some things we ought not to do, or we ought absolutely not to do? I've presented the consequentialist ethics, which tend to say uh, there's nothing, there's no act that you could describe that you could say you would never do, no matter what the circumstances, because if there were circumstances like the ones uh, Ivan imagines here, then um, almost, well, anything really could be justifiable. But there are some ethical views 
that reject that. Obviously, Dostoevsky has one in mind. And probably the best known of them is, uh, again, to go back to Immanuel Kant, um, I, we had one version of Kant's categorical imperative in an earlier lecture when I talked about his idea that you should only act if you can make the maximum of your action into a universal law. Um, now, when you think about that universal law idea, it doesn't really tell you whether there are some things that it's wrong to do no matter what the consequences or not. For example, it doesn't really tell you the universal law idea. It doesn't tell you whether it would be justified to torture a baby to death in order to bring about utopia. Because some people will say, yes, I could make that a universal law. If somehow you ever were in those circumstances that you could bring about utopia by torturing a baby to death, that's what you ought to do. And I think that would apply in all of those cases, whatever cases they might be. Whereas somebody else might say, no, I think you should never torture the innocent, and I think that's a universal law. So the universal law formulation, interesting as it is in some ways, in excluding, uh, if you like, a bias for yourself, a preference for yourself, the universal law formulation doesn't really get very specific on questions like uh, the one that Dostoevsky asked. This is a, another formulation. Kant says they're somehow equivalent, although he doesn't really show how they're equivalent. But he thinks that this is a kind of another formulation of the same idea of the universal law formulation. Uh, so he also regards this as the, a version of the categorical imperative. And it's something that people very often say. Again, it's something you hear people talking about when they try to give a sort of more fundamental principle for the judgments that they're making. They say, you should never treat anyone merely as a means. You should always treat people as ends in themselves. So um, the question is, uh, what is it um, to treat someone only as a means rather than as an end in themselves, and why? There's, uh, there's a second question that I've mentioned here. Who do you include in humanity? Right? So, because Kant says treat humanity. Assuming that we're clear about what we mean by human beings, or that we're talking about very clear cases of human beings, of humanity, what is it to treat someone merely as a means, and uh, why is it wrong? So, firstly, you, you'll need to exclude some fairly obvious cases of things that we think of as justifiable um, that look like treating people um, merely as a means. So uh, you put something in the mail, assuming you're still using uh, regular postal services to send paper rather than emails. You put something in the mail, you know that there's going to be a person who is going to deliver that to the address that you've addressed it. Um, that person seems to be merely a means for you, for your item of mail, to get to the address where you want. But there doesn't seem anything wrong with that. Why is that? Well, obviously, people can say things like, um, that person has consented to be used in this way. That person has uh, freely undertaken employment for which he or she is being paid and has consented to being used as a means. So they're not being used merely as a means because they're being paid and they've chosen to take that occupation. And that makes employment different from slavery. The slave is being used merely as a means. No consideration for what the slave consents to or not. But the uh, male person is being used um, not merely as a means. So if we build in notions of consent like that, we can deal with those sorts of cases. But there are other cases where it doesn't seem obvious that it's wrong to treat someone merely as a means. Um, another example that you might think about is, uh, suppose you're waiting at the train station and there's a very cold, nasty wind 
Uh, it's winter blowing at you. Um, and there's a group of, let's say, there's a football team that's waiting for the train. They're all big guys, um, broad shoulders, tall, much bigger than you. And they're standing in a line. So is it OK for you to get downwind of them so that they break the cold wind and you don't get so cold? Right? Well, you, you, you don't ask them for their consent. Maybe, in fact, you know, they've got their backs to you. They don't even know that you're doing this. Um, in a sense, you're using them merely as a means and without their consent to uh, get shelter from the wind. Um, there doesn't seem anything wrong with that. Um, you're not harming them in any way. So that might be a more another case where even without your consent, you're entitled to use people merely as a means. And again, you could say something here. You could say, well, you're not harming them at all. They probably wouldn't mind. Um, if you went up to them and asked them if they minded if you stood behind them, they might think it's a pretty strange question. But you know, no doubt they'd say yes. Why wouldn't they? So um, that's, not a har and a, that's not a morally wrong case of using someone as a means. Uh, you can have that. You could, you could accept that, I guess. But um, here's a case that Derek Parfitt has put up, which I think is more of a problem for people who want to defend the Kantian principle. Because this is a case that harms somebody slightly. OK? So Parfitt asks you to imagine that you're in an earthquake. Uh, after an earthquake, you're trapped in some building that is slowly collapsing. You and your child are trapped there, uh, and also a stranger. And, um, the only way you can save your child from being killed by the collapsing rubble, again, we don't know exactly why this is so, but the only way you can do it is by using this stranger who's called Black as a shield um, to somehow, maybe the stranger won't be hurt by the collapsing rubble, but your child being small will be killed by it. Um, except the stranger will be hurt a little bit. The stranger's one of, one of Black's toes is going to be crushed. Um, but that's the only thing you can do. You're, you can't shield your child yourself because you're trapped too far away from the child. You can somehow just um, push black uh, in this position where black will stop the rubble collapsing on your child, um, but be slightly hurt. And again, to get around the question of, well, why not ask black if that's OK with black, we can assume that um, black is being knocked temporarily unconscious by the collapsing rubble, so you can't, you can't um, ask black. Uh, but Black's going to recover from consciousness, and the question is whether he'll recover completely uninjured or whether he'll recover with a crushed toe. Um, but that's the only way you can save your child's life. Um, it seems to me here that, that that's an OK thing to do. I don't know whether does anybody Want to object to that? Does anyone think it would be wrong to use black in this way without black's consent to protect your child, to save your child's life? Maybe we haven't got any really hardline Kantians here. I don't know. But anyway, I think, I think Parfit is, is producing the example with the expectation that you'll share his view that this is not wrong. So if that's so, then as I say, it's a more serious problem for the Kantian objection because um, here you are harming black. And it's at least possible that black would not consent. Right? I mean, black might say, um, look, I don't care about you and your child. Never met you before. Um, I don't want to be injured at all. I don't want even to have a broken toe. Um, so no, you can't use me. But black. You're not, you're not asking Black for his consent. So if it's justifiable to do it, it seems that this is at least not an exceptionless moral rule. And it does seem that what's going on is we're balancing harms here. Now, the, the straightforward utilitarian would say, as long as the harm to Black is less than the benefit to your child, it's OK even to do more than crush Black's toe. It's OK to break. Black's leg, or perhaps break both of Black's legs. And at that point, you might be starting to say, hmm, I'm not sure whether I agree with the, the utilitarian position here. Um, but to some extent, anyway, it seems that there is some sort of balancing going on, some weighing of the seriousness of the harm, which means that 
the rule about using someone as an end doesn't seem to be an absolute rule. 